right. So good to see each and every one of you. Try not to hold you too long today. It's really cold out there today. Uh, and we're going to focus today on the Lord's Supper. I know last week we, we took a look, we take a look at a collection and, and went through that and found out we don't tithe anymore, but we do collections now. So I want to go through each act of worship. So today we're going to take a look at the Lord's Supper. And it reminds me of a story. Uh, of a four-year-old that was in church, and uh, when the communion plate came by, he was looking at the communion really hard, and he was just about to grab it. And his mother said, no, you are not old enough to drink communion. So he said, okay. So a little bit later, uh, the collection plate came around, and his mother looked at him funny, and she, she gave him some money to put in the collection. And he looked at her, and she said, what? Well, you better put your money in. He said, if I'm not old enough to take communion, I'm not old enough to get it. He said, I can't eat. I ain't paying. So that's all I want to focus on today, the Lord's Supper. So we're going to take a look at that. Um, because we think about worship. Worship has great privileges. But we want to make sure that when we worship, that we do things according to the Bible, according to the Spirit, and according to the truth. So today we will learn what is the Lord's Supper, the time and frequency of the Lord's Supper, and some common misunderstandings that people have about the Lord's Supper. So first of all, I want to go to our text. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. And we're going to start at verse number 23. And we're going to read a few of these verses here for our lesson today. It is 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to start at verse number 23. And the Bible says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do you, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So we have what we call the Lord's Supper, or we call it communion. And I want to go through some, a few things about this thing. First of all, it's a memorial. When I think about memorials, I think about funerals, right? Whenever we have a memorial service, we think about that person, we, 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 we funeralize that person, we think about the good things they did in their life, we often don't focus on the bad things. So we focus on the pleasantries and the things they did in their life when we have a memorial service. And often we have their picture placed aside. And we just want to make sure that we have this memorial service. Why? Because we don't want to forget that particular person. A few years ago, I went to New York City, and I seen the memorial they had for 9-11. They had all the names on the wall of all the people that were killed on that particular day. And I thought to myself, why would they have this? But it's just a memorial. They want us to never forget what happened on that particular day. I'm sure many of us, we remember what we were doing that day. Uh, I, remember what, I remember almost everything about that day. I remember going to work that day, work for IBM at that time. And I remember us going to work and seeing that first tower, and we were watching it, we were watching it in our conference room, and another tower hitting. Everybody was so distraught. But again, it's something that I don't care who you are, it's something you will never, ever forget. And that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's, it's, it's an emblem that, that God gave us so that we would never forget Christ's death. And so specifically, that's what this is about. It's about his death. So when Jesus took the Lord's Supper, he took unleavened bread, and he said, we are about to eat this in remembrance of my body. He also took the fruit of the vine and said, we were doing this in remembrance of my blood. So it's just a time to reflect, to remember, Jesus Christ, and specifically remember his death. But just like a person who might set these you know, pictures out at memorial, we have to remember our loved ones, and we do it in various ways. So Jesus said, I want you to remember me this way. So he said, the, the next logical question is, he said to do this, he told them, I want y'all to remember me, how? By doing this communion. So the next question is, what are we supposed to remember? I often hear people say the death, the burial, and resurrection of the Lord. But actually, let's let me see what the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So when I am going through communion, when the communion plate comes around, it's three things that God wants 
must be focused on. His death, his body, and his blood. Certainly, when we think about, again, the resurrection, all those things are included, but this specifically is about three things. His death, <coughs> his blood, and his body. Now, I want you to think about that as we, we, we further on, uh, go along with this lesson. But we're remembering the price that was paid for the remission of our sins. It reminds me of that old spiritual song. It says, were you there when they crucified our Lord? And of course, none of us was there, but the Bible gives us so many clues. So we can picture that particular day when our Lord and Savior was crucified. In fact, let's go to John 19 and verse number 1. John 19 and 1. Because I want you to visualize today what the Lord did for us. And why the Lord's Supper is so important. And why we should have complete focus when the Lord's Supper is going around. Should nobody be passing around notes. Thinking about anything else but but Christ's body and his blood. And that's what we got to get to today. And I, I want us to really focus on that. But John mentioned the one said, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Now history says when they did the scourging, oftentimes it was two people that would do it. They would take turns beating the back of the legs and all the, the parts of the body of a person when they did a crucifixion. And the reason why they would do that, because often when sometimes when somebody would beat somebody, they would get tired. So they had a, another person that would step in. So a person might just bam, 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 bam. He's tired. Another person come in. So they often had two scourges when they did the scourge. So, and the scourges often had a, a, a flagger. And the flagger is, is, is a, consists of a whip. And it has two lead balls on the end of it. So it a, it, sometimes it was made of sheep, sheep bone. It was something that was meant to really do a lot of damage on someone's back. So again, they would take turns, beating the back, just beating them, beating them, beating them. Oftentimes this, this beating was so bad that the person getting beat, tongue, they would cut their tongue in half. Because the pain was so intense that they would end up biting their tongue off. It would just hurt so bad. So I think about that. When I think about when I see that uh, the communion going around, I think about Christ. I think about the bruises that he took, that flesh that hung. I think about all the things that he went through. I envision the nails being driven in his hand. And oftentimes, we have to be closer to the, the bottom of his hand because that would be enough to hold up the weight of a body. So I often think about when they took that, they took that uh, hammer and they just drilled those nails in his hand. And I often think about, too, when they had to pull them up on that cross. He was on the ground, and they pulled him up and hung him up on that cross for the whole world to see. And it reminds me of what Jesus said. If I be lifted up, I will drop all men unto me. So him lifted up was what saved us today. But can you see his body on that cross? Do you see him and what he did for you and I? The fact that he left heaven to come down knowing he was going to suffer a cruel death. Can you see it? Can you see him on the cross? Can you see him right now? Then I'm not going to take of the fruit of the vine. That's when I think about the bread and the body of Christ. But when I think about the fruit of the vine, I imagine that blood. I think about our picture of putting that crown of thorns on his head and that blood just dripping down his face. That's what I often think about. I think about them beating his back so bad that the blood was dripping down from his back. Those are the things I think about when I think about my Lord and Savior, the pain that he endured, what he was willing to do for you and I. So when that communion plate comes around, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the sacrifice that God had made for us. In fact, let's go to John 19 and 34. John 19 and 34. Because I see, again, his back bloody and beating. I see the Roman soldier pressing his side. What came out? Blood and water. The Bible says in 19, John 19, 34, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately came out blood and water. I want you to visualize that. I want you to see Christ on that cross. I want you to see that soldier putting that spear in his side. I want you to see that blood and water coming out of that wound. I want you to visualize this. I want you to think about this because Jesus said, Matthew 28, 
26 and 28. This do in remembrance of me. So why is this blood of Christ <coughs> so precious? Well, Ephesians 1 and 7 says, because without the blood, there is no remission. So because of Christ's blood, we all have the ability to be remitted of our sins. Without Christ going to that cross, without the blood being shed, none of us would have an opportunity to be saved. Ephesians 1 and 7 says, without that blood, there is no remission of sins. So now I'm going to answer the second question. What is the Lord's Supper? Not only is it memorial, but it's also a proclamation. When we do the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming to the world that yes, we believe in Christ. We believe that he died. We believe that he wrote. We believe everything about the death of Christ. We believe he's the Son of God. <coughs> Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 11, 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Why is it important to proclaim his death? Because his death is what brings us redemption. And the third thing about this being a memorial, I want us to think about it. It's a memorial, it's a proclamation, but it's also a fellowship. It's a communion with Christ. How do we know this? Well, Matthew 26 and 29. He said to his disciples, But I will not drink with you of the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So what does he mean by that? He's clearly referencing the Lord's Supper. So when we engage in the Lord's Supper, Christ is saying we are communing, we are communing with him. 1 Corinthians 10 and 16 says, he says that the cup of the blessing which is which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Now this word communion, it comes from the Greek, which means a joint sharing, or a joint participation. And sometimes it's translated as fellowship. So as I partake of the Lord's Supper, I am fellowshipping with Christ directly. Christ said that he would partake of it with us in the kingdom, and he does this Every first day of the week. So now let's get to that. Time and frequency. I've heard so many people say, well, they take it once a year. Or we take it on, on Christmas and Easter. Or we take it twice a year. Well, first of all, y'all, anything and everything that we do, it has to be an example for it in the Bible. For us to, to follow that. We have to look like that first century church. So we can't come up with our own ways and say, you know what? One sounds good. Two sounds good. No, we have to have an example. So we're going to go through examples that we have in the Bible. Because some people will say, well, one of the said, well, they're going to do a candlelight service on Thursday. Well, other ones say, well, we're going to do it on Saturday. And some of them will say, well, we're going to do it every day. But the problem with that is, this is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that Christians came together on the first day of the week. In fact, Acts 27 says, now when the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, that is to partake of the Lord's Supper. It's very clear when they came together, Paul was ready to depart to them and spoke to them. But I want you to see that they partook of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, Acts 27. And it's interesting here that that Greek phrase means kata, means came together every week. So it says that they came together, and it's also in a passive voice indicated that their gathering, their assembly was not on their own, it was directed by God. They didn't come up with their own way. In other words, it was God's ideal when they came together on the first day of the week. Why? I'm going to give you three reasons why. First of all, it's the day that the Lord arose from the dead. The day that Jesus got up out that grave. Secondly, it's the day that the church of Christ began. And thirdly, it's the day that the early Christians partook of. So we celebrate it because we can recognize when they did it. They did it on the first day of the week. Don't every week got a first day. I think it does. Amen. So when it says how often we should have taken it, the Bible says Acts 2 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostle doctrine and fellowship, breaking their bread and in prayers. Now, some people will say, I've heard people say, well, y'all do it too much. It loses its significance if you do it every single week. I I, I beg the difference. I, I truly beg the difference. Uh uh, because God has given us all these different blessings, and it's okay if we just take five minutes every single week.
we to recognize what he did for us. There's no problem in doing that. But in fact, if I were to find an example of them doing that in the Bible, I, I say, you know what? Okay, we can do that. But the only example we have in the Bible is they came together when? On the first day of the week. So when did we come together? On the first day of the week. We didn't commune how they did. We got to follow the apostles' doctrine. And when they came together, they communed and gave that stuff. So what is it inconsistent of God to have specific days, specific time for the feast in the Old Testament, but not have a specific time, a specific, a specific feast for the New Testament? It wouldn't make any sense. God is the same all the time. So God has made it to where that this feast takes place when? Each and every week. So now I want to get to my last part of this sermon, which will be the abuses, the misunderstandings of what the Lord's Supper is. Okay, I want you to realize, first of all, just like Acts 20 and 7 say when they came together upon the first day of the week, we went to collection, we went to the offering last week, we talked about 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. The very same language that's used there when it says every week is when they gave, it's the same language used when it's talking about Communion every week. In fact, like I said earlier, the word kata means every. In fact, if you got an NASB Bible, and you read 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 2, it's going to say every first day of the week. Friends, I'm here to tell you that every example that we can actually find in the Bible is very clear that they came together upon the first day of the week to break bread, which is communion. And when they did that, they did this as the Lord had told them to do it. But I want you to think about something else. It never can lose significance because of how much time that God gives us. People say, well, y'all, with the church of Christ, y'all do way too much. Think about this, folks. That we have 10,080 minutes every week. It's okay to spend five to recognize what God has done for us. It's okay to spend that prayers. Five, it's been five minutes recognizing what God has done with us. But I want to get some common misunderstandings here. First of all, there's a, there's a misunderstanding that the, the Lord Supper literally becomes uh, flesh, and it's called transubstantiation. That the, the, it becomes literal flesh. I'm not sure if you've heard about this doctrine before, but if some people teach this particular doctrine. Well, that would be cannibalism. Cannibalism now. It wouldn't be transubstantiation. In fact, they're trying to teach something that we have to do a re-sacrifice when God has said that he sacrificed once for all. In fact, let's go to Hebrews 9 and 28. Hebrews 9 and 28. We're going to break down some of these things because we hear these false doctrines being taught across the world, and that's what I'm here to do to this fellow. And the Bible says that in Hebrews 9 and 28, that he lived out of himself once, once and for all, once and only once. So he got, Jesus had to offer himself every single time we commit a sin. Why? Because his blood continually washes away our sins. And that's the second misconception I want to take about, is that some people have a, what they call a holy Eucharist. And what that is, it becomes a sacrifice. In, in, in other words, that when they take that communion, that that communion prays the price for their sins. That God pardons them no matter what they do. I, I haven't seen a movie. I think it was called Godfather. Years ago. When the guy murdered somebody, he went to his priest and said, well, you know what? Uh, take some Hail Marys and uh, take this communion. You, you forgive it. Right? We won't find that anywhere in the Bible, though. Right? We won't find that in the Bible. Because once we are baptized, when I contact the blood of Jesus, my sins are forgiven continually. Taking communion does not affect, does not have anything to do with your sin being forgiven at all. And some of the people teach this, but it's not true. If we want continual forgiveness for our sins, we've got to follow 1 John 1, 7 through 9. It tells us by repentance, by confession, by Prayer and by walking in the light is how we get continual forgiveness of our sins. It's not by taking the Lord's Supper. How many people think they are forgiven to do whatever they want to do? And as long as they take it, especially with the Italian mob, it was a real popular thing. 
They'll take that, they'll take that and be like, hey, I'm going to kill somebody tomorrow. And go take some more, right? But that's not what God says. Not, that's, not, that's not the purpose of it. So I want to look at the last misconception, which is actually in this particular context. It's not concerning the Lord's body. What does that mean? Well, oftentimes people don't realize this, but the early church, you know how we have our fellowship, fellowship meals over there next door? The early church often would have fellowship meals before they worship. <coughs> so often when he, he's going to mention uh, something about them not, not doing things right, but he's talking about the actual fellowship meal. Then he goes from the fellowship meal to the actual communion in this particular context. So what was going on in the church at the time, they would have people come and travel to the congregation, and what would happen was that the people that was already there would eat up all the food before the other people could come. Now they had four people that were coming to the church, and they didn't have any food by the time they got there because all the people that were well do had eaten up all the food before they got there. This is why you tell them, y'all go home and eat. This is not the purpose of you eating. So he wanted them to understand that there was a difference between a common meal and recognizing the sacrifice of Christ. When you're doing something for Christ, you have to recognize it's distinct, it's different. They were treated just like a common meal. They would go for they would come to the church. They'd be like somebody going to the church during the middle of the week. Come in here and eat the crackers of bread and all that. You'd be like, what's wrong with you, right? They would literally be doing that. They would go to the congregation. They would eat the bread and, and do like it was just a regular common meal. So that was the problem that he was addressing here at, 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 at this particular time. And so that's why the Bible says that, uh, 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 let's read verse 21. He said, for eating, each one has taken his own supper of him of us. And one is hungry, another is drunk. They was at the church drunk and hungry, just, just doing all whatever they want to do. But he says, what? Do you not have houses to eat in and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? So in verse 27, tells us they were taking the Lord's Supper unworthily. What does that mean? So some people say, I've seen people say, I can't take the Lord's Supper this week. I'm not worthy. Nobody will ever be worthy if you look at it like that, y'all. He says, unworthily. So it means it's an action. It means something they were doing wasn't right. Again, I just mentioned to you what they were doing. So he said, what y'all are doing makes the Lord's Supper uncommon. Makes it a common meal. Makes it, makes it not holy anymore. And you're not very careful. You can find yourself doing that same thing. When, that's, when, that, when we go around with that communion, you need to be completely focused on Christ. Completely focused on what he did for us. I want you to imagine those nails going on his hands, in and his feet, him hanging on that cross six long hours. That's what we should focus on when that communion is going around. So what is the Lord's Supper? It's one more. It's the proclamation. It's the communion. It's not the time to think about your bills or the cares of the world. It's the time to be completely focused on Christ and his sacrifice. When should we take up? Every and first day of the week. How should we do it? Thoughtfully. Consider our body of Christ. That's why he said, don't do it unworthily. They were doing it unworthily again because they made it a common thing. They made it a ritual. And if, we, if we're not careful, we can be just doing the same thing, y'all. Be very focused when that lower supper is going wrong. Oh, we should see anybody passing notes. You should only be thinking about what Christ has done for us during that time. It's a very important time. Just like at a funeral. You won't see nobody doing anything else but honoring that person, right? Focus on that person at that funeral. That's what God is telling us. This is a memorial for him. Like I mentioned earlier, John 12, 32. He said, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will drop all the <laughs> unto me. Jesus is calling you to fellowship and communion with him. His death brings us life, a life for abundance. Do you see him on the Christ? He's on that cross ready to forgive you your sins. All he wants you to do is come forward and admit to you, admit to him that you need him. Admit to him that, you know what, I'm lost without you, Lord. Admit to him that, you know what, I know I can't have my forgiveness without you, without your sacrifice, without you paying the price on that cross, Lord, I know. So what does that mean? That means that you know that we're in sin. All of us in Romans 3, 20, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the beauty of God is 
that he continually forgives you of all your sins. All you gotta do is ask forgiveness. Isn't that wonderful to know that his blood, when you accepting him in baptism, paid the cost for your salvation. Jesus said that if you want to be with me, you must be born again. One thing I say about Jesus, Jesus can't want for you what you don't want for yourself. If you want to be saved, part of it falls on you. He did his part. He went to the cross. He gave up his life. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to accept him? How do you accept him? Jesus said, if you believe in me, believe I'm the son of God, you'll be willing to walk down that aisle. Give me your heart. Give me your hand and guide your heart and say, you know what? Lord, I believe in you. I want to forget some of my sins. I want to be like a newborn baby. No sin. That's the chance that he's giving you today. He's calling you today. He's giving you that opportunity to come down and change your life and your soul and your spiritual direction. Forever. Yeah. We're going to give you a chance to come forward right now. Let me sing the same.